In the immortal words of Ferris Bueller, <laughs> life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around every once in a while, you can miss it. Maybe with this spirit in mind, when I graduated from university in the late 90s, I decided to go on a road trip across the US. I had an internship starting in two weeks in New York City, so I was trying to figure out if I could go from the East Coast to the Pacific Ocean and back in time. Mathematics told me that I could, as long as I didn't spend uh, too much time resting in any one place. Um, I recruited a friend of mine, a floor mate at university, a Japanese guy named Masaki Nakayama. He didn't speak much, uh, Masaki. Uh, his, English, <laughs> his English was okay, uh, but basically he spoke enough. Um, more importantly, like me, he wanted to see the rest of America before life got in the way. Uh, anything to delay the routine of the salary man, as they say in Japan. <laughs> the trip needed to be 12 days long. Since we decided we wanted to spend at least one day with a friend in Amish country in Ohio, and three days in San Francisco, California, stopped with some friends there, the only way that we could possibly get back in time was to keep a steady pace along the open road and only stop for gas, so not stopping to sleep. <laughs> So during the day, we drove in four-hour blocks um, and then changed drivers. Starting at midnight every night, we switched on one-hour blocks to avoid having an accident because the body really isn't meant to be awake during those wee hours in the morning, <laughs> let alone behind the wheel. Without stopping, it takes just about three full days to get all the way across the U.S. So that's just under 5,000 kilometers. Just to put some local perspective on it, that's about 1,800 kilometers more than the southernmost tip of India all the way to the northernmost tip of India. When you're either driving or sleeping for 70 hours straight, you're in a kind of permanent fog. <laughs> Even when you're sleeping, you're not fully sleeping. I would wake up all the time on the passenger side of the car, like in terror, grabbing at the wheel uh, where I think, I think it was supposed to be. <laughs> But sometimes a strange sensation would stir me, like the two times that I woke up to see Masaki with a huge smile on his face, <laughs> like a bullet train cutting through the desert, topping the speedometer out at 165, 170 kilometers per hour. And this is on the highway where the speed limit was about 115 kilometers. Um, the first time I saw that, I told him very uh, sternly to slow down. It was my mom's car, uh, after all. <laughs> the, second time, the second time I saw that, I told them that in America, if someone gets pulled over going that speed, everyone in the car gets arrested and the car gets impounded. Now he, fe now he felt bad. The Japanese, they like to follow rules, and this is clearly rule breaking. <laughs> of course, I had just made that up to scare him. Uh, <laughs> but he believed, the important thing was he believed me. And he apologized for jeopardizing the trip. Now, I kind of felt bad for my lie making him feel bad. Uh, but I said something like, it's OK, man. Uh, what's done is done. <laughs> Just don't do it. Do not do it again. <laughs> so if you've ever taken a road trip across the US, you already know this. But um, when the endless cornfields of Nebraska and the Midwest like, finally give way to the beginnings of the mountains, the view is just stunning. Stunning is actually a drastic understatement. You, you really haven't seen my country until you've seen the sun rise through every possible shade of pink bursting onto the horizon between the two twin peaks, uh, snow-capped peak of, of the Rockies. The sight is so grand and magical that it's hard to believe that it happens like that every morning. As amazing as the view was, sleep was actually more precious. <laughs> we stopped for about three minutes to enjoy the view just south of a town called Boulder, Colorado, but got right back in the car to continue. For the next stretch, continuing further west, we instinctively, instinctively knew not to wake each other up for any particular points of interest. Uh, this is sad to say because in, in general, I'm a firm believer in the philosophy that you should enjoy the journey, not just the destination in life. But in this particular instance, uh, the passenger, the, the sleeper, did not care. <laughs> Moments worth stopping for belong to the driver and to the driver alone in brief fleeting glances. Which is why I was enraged the following afternoon when curled up in some mangled but somehow effective position on the passenger seat, somehow managed to get, managing to get some sleep, I felt an elbow hit me. 
and then a shake of my shoulder. So this had never happened before. <laughs> Are you really waking me up? I said to him, super annoyed. And this is where it started to get weird. I looked over at him, and instead of explaining himself, he just looked straight ahead, still driving. <laughs> The sun was full in the sky and huge, and we were on the outskirts of some small, dusty town uh, in Utah, not far from a place called Moab. Hey, what is it, man? Again, he didn't say anything, but he just pointed over his right shoulder with his thumb and said, Hazukashi desu. Which in Japanese means I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I turned. Okay, behind us there was a police car. <laughs> a white Crown Victoria with all its lights on. And when I mean all its lights on, I mean every conceivable light that the car had anywhere on it was on and flashing. And there was a single officer inside with a very large and very bright red uh, face. And even though we couldn't hear him, he was clearly screaming at the top of his lungs while pointing over and over again to our car in the side of the road. I said, Jesus, Masaki, pull the car over. So he pulled the car over. I said, what the hell, man? And he said, I was scared to wake you up. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? How long was he back there? And he said, I don't know, about five minutes. <laughs> okay, anyone who's ever been pulled over by the police in the United States knows that anything more than 15 seconds is the wrong answer to that question. <laughs> I can't imagine what the cop was thinking as we rolled on for two or three kilometers uh, uh, while his car lit up like a Christmas tree. It was our version of the O.J. Simpson low-speed chase. <laughs> um, Masaki hung his head. He wasn't your typical Japanese guy, but maybe his country's strong sense of shame and dishonor were still intact. It was super hot outside, and now it was getting hotter inside because both the car and the AC were turned off. Just then, the cop jumps out of his car, pointing his gun at us and screaming for us to put our hands on the dashboard. Okay, adrenaline shoots right from my head all the way to my toes. I had never had a gun pointed at me before, which I know is hard to believe considering I'm American. <laughs> So I glared over at Masaki. I said, oh my God, please tell me you didn't run over a child or something. This is so In typical indirect Japanese style, he says, maybe I was going a little fast. I shook my head. I told you, man. Shame, dishonor. So our hands are on the dashboard. Uh, where there were beads of sweat before, now there's flow. The cop is moving at this point, and now he's making his way over to the passenger side uh, of the car. So in the mirror, I can see him a little bit. Okay, this is what it was like. He was about 65 years old and had a big cowboy hat on and an equally big grayish white Fu Manchu mustache. He was festooned with a, with a white shirt and a, like kind of a goldish badge half like hanging off his pocket. He was about my height, so not tall. Uh, but maybe two and a half times my weight. So he had a substantial stomach hanging out over tight belt bla uh, belted black pants. He was also sweating profusely, and he still had that very, very red face. For any Americans in the audience, uh, there is a kind of a Yosemite Sam thing going on. Yeah. <laughs> but unlike Yosemite Sam, this guy was very nervous, to say the least, and this scenario was clearly beyond his managerial ability slash previous experience. I just had that sense. Um, most importantly, as he's getting closer, he's yelling at me to find the car's registration documents and our licenses, ending with, get your hands on the dash, as loud as he possibly could. Cops in the US actually always say this, put your hands there, but do this other thing with your hands at the same time. <laughs> Obviously, this was confusing, but I didn't feel like it was the right time to point out the logical flaw in, in his instructions. So I'm looking at him to my right, making sure he sees my hands, and I go, go to the glove compartment, that we call it the glove compartment, to get the documents. When I take them out, he's standing right at my window now, and I can see him clearly. He's still sweating, 
and he's still pointing the gun right at me. And, and nobody's talking for a little while, so it kind of feels like an old-fashioned Western standoff or something like that. <laughs> Um, I can see the weapon very clearly now, and I'm staring right at it. So like I said before, without sleep, you're kind of like in a perpetual fog. Nothing seems 100% real when you're overdoing it like that. Everything's a dream, and you really can't wrap your mind around the important details. It's like when you pull an all-nighter, and then you try to function again the next day. Everything is just kind of glazed over. So I'm really staring at this gun now, and I'm kind of just getting lost in it a little bit. It's silver, like the barrel part, the shiny part is silver. But I swear to God that it looks like it has an ivory handle on it. I thought ivory because it was like bony white and was carved with a seam. Like somebody had taken some serious time to, to, to work on this piece. There was a carving of a steed, like a reared up, like a wild stallion <laughs> on its back legs. There was a horse, and, and another horse, and a tree. And in the distance, there were some cowboys and even some Native Americans thrown in in full headdress. Um, honestly, the gun looked like an antique, uh, like something you would see at a flea market or a bazaar or a museum, even. Uh, I was thinking that you definitely would not fire a gun like this. Uh, it wasn't the ideal time at all, but when I fully took in the extent of the gun's ornamentation, I really wanted to laugh. <laughs> was I scared? Absolutely. But that doesn't change the fact that it, the gun looked like if he had actually somehow managed to pull the trigger, a puff of smoke would have come out, or like a cartoon, the word, a flag with the word, word bang written on it. <laughs> it took every conscious muscle in my face and every neuron in my half-functioning brain to stop my lips from curling uh, into a smile as he pointed at the gun at me from a meter away. <laughs> Again, was I scared? Yes. Was the gun funny nevertheless? Yes. <laughs> I managed to roll down the window and give him the registration and my license. He wanted Masaki's license too, of course. He was driving. So Masaki goes into his wallet and unfolds a massive piece of paper, which he tells me is a Japanese international driver's permit. <laughs> like a certificate or something like that, um, complete with the round uh, red hanko stamp like right on it. I didn't like the looks of this thing, uh, but I shrugged and passed it on to the cop, who's still pointing the gun at us. Uh, I felt like I was handing a teacher a diorama when he'd asked for a book report. <laughs> What's this? I, I guess that's his license. That, that big piece of paper is his license. He clearly hadn't seen anything like this before, and so he stared at us. He already hated us, and now we were digging ourselves deeper. He took all of our stuff and said, don't move and slowly walked back to his car, snapping his head back every few seconds to check on us. I confirmed with Masaki to make sure that this giant paper was valid, and he said it was. I also mentioned the interesting gun, and if he had gotten a good look at it. And he said, Tabun korekatsu no aitemu desu. Maybe a collector's item. <laughs> I thought so too. Keep in mind that this was a 100% real cop. I know in India, sometimes fake cops will try to pull people over. Um, this cop, despite being in over his head, was definitely a genuine thing. The cop was in his car a long time, probably 15 minutes, but it felt like an hour. Uh, so I, I look over at Masaki, and I see that he's trying to take a photo of the police car. <laughs> Please don't, I said. <laughs> Totally deflated at this point. <laughs> okay, he said, and snapped the picture anyway. <laughs> when the cop finally came back, the gun was now holstered and he had stopped sweating. He asked me, why didn't you guys pull over? I was asleep and he was confused, I said. And then he said, if you guys had kept going for another 20 more seconds, I would have run your car off the road, right into a ditch. That ditch. <laughs> and sure enough, up ahead 20 meters, there was a ditch off the side of the road, dipping down about 10 meters into a gully. I imagined the car flipping down it sideways, which definitely would have been a worse way to wake up. <laughs> he said to me, did you hear about those fugitives that escaped from a prison in Denver? We actually did know about that because it was all, all over the news nationwide that summer, in the midst of a prison transfer at a maximum security facility, two convicts had killed a guard and were on the loose. 
the last time we had heard about this news story, we were a thousand miles away, but we had driven so far that now Denver was only two hours from where we were. They're still on the loose, he said, and they stole a car this morning. We don't get too many Connecticut license plates all the way over here, so we thought maybe you were them, <laughs> but you're not. <laughs> that was correct. We were not them. <laughs> One of them even had a bright orange jacket like the one you have in the back seat, he said. He's got good taste, I guess. <laughs> he didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you pull us over, I ventured to ask. He was speeding. How fast was he going? Let's see. And he pulls out his notepad. This is a country road, not a highway. The speed limit was 56 kilometers per hour, and he was going 85. Okay, all of a sudden, I felt instantly allied with Masaki. Up to that point, strangely enough, I had actually been somewhere between neutral and slightly against Masaki in alliance with this cop because I was annoyed that my friend had flouted the speed limit. And I, although it was terrifying, I was secretly satisfied that he was being humiliated for not driving more carefully. But... 29 kilometers per hour over the limit, uh, which is just 18 miles, miles per hour uh, on a basically empty road, that's, that's nothing. Uh, everybody does that. Uh, that's not a big deal. He put his pad away and pulled out his citation book. And then what he said next, I'll never forget. He said, I'm going to write you boys a big old ticket. <laughs> so I glared at Masaki and growled. Tickets are expensive in Connecticut, where I'm from, or any of the small states next to it, like Massachusetts or New York or New Jersey. The base fine depends, uh, dif differs depending on where you are, but there's an added uh, fee for every stage, like over the, the speed limit. This was 29 kilometers per hour, and being on a normal road and not the highway, the situation like this could easily run you 250, even 300 US dollars, once all the various fees were included. That's over 15,000 rupees. He takes out his pen and he wrote the amount down. As he wrote the amount down, he said each word slowly and dramatically as he wrote. One hundred dollars. So my hands instinctively went up to my mouth to cover a laugh that got caught in my throat. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, a hundred dollars is a lot of money. Uh, for a speeding, but for a speeding ticket under these circumstances, it really wasn't that much. Um, combined with the whole gun thing too, like uh, it all just became too much for me. And I covered my face and it took me about three or four seconds to gather my composure and to change my reaction into a look of surprise and shock. <laughs> he, wrote, he wrote out the amount and was looking at me and I took my hands down and I let out an overly dramatic breath and I said, wow. That's quite a bit, but we deserve it. <laughs> and he handed me the ticket. I looked at it, I looked at the ticket, looked at him, and said, thank you. Uh, he's off to Tokyo, but I'll be back in Connecticut in about a week, and I'll make that check out right away, send it along. No, he said. Because he was going more than 25 kilometers over the speed limit, uh, per hour over the speed limit, that means that this ticket is a ticket, but also a court summons. So you have to pay this ticket right now or I take you to jail. I said, you mean here? <laughs> In cash? So I guess in India, the tavern's quite a bit. <laughs> Small fines and sometimes medium-sized ones are just part of the normal driving experience for some people. But in the US, this kind of thing does not happen like that. We're in the middle of God knows where, tumbleweeds crossing the street, not a soul in sight, and the only upright things you can see are the occasional cactus and Yosemite Sam in our window. It just so happens that a few hours before all of this, right as we were switching drivers, Masaki and I had stopped at an ATM to get gas and food money for the next week. We took out 200 US dollars and it was sitting in a little bundle not far from the car radio. Something seemed really fishy to me about this court summons <laughs> nonsense. Though to be fair, a police officer friend of mine uh, uh, a few weeks later would tell me that he's technically correct in some states that this is true. Nevertheless, not feeling comfortable with this whole thing, I said to him, we don't have $100. And he stared at us. And then he said, well, how much do you have? <laughs> 
I said, $40. We have $40. So he looks at me, looks over to the side, and then he takes the ticket out of my hand and starts writing on it. And he's changing the speed of the car to match what it would need to be to be a $40 ticket. <laughs> so all this writing he was doing gave me a chance to lean forwards ever so slightly and stuff most of the wad of money deeper into the console <laughs> near the radio, but pull out two 20s. He handed me back the ticket. I handed him the cash. He tipped his oversized cowboy hat, and then he waved goodbye and waddled back to his cruiser. And I took a deep breath. Like a wounded samurai, Masaki pulled back onto the road, <laughs> slowly, and then onto Interstate 70 towards California. I tried to explain to him just how unusual what had happened was, but I'm not sure if I did it justice. Despite the temptations offered by the wide open road and the empty roads of Arizona and New Mexico and later Wyoming and Nevada, uh, something tells me Masaki didn't try speeding after that. But then again, how would I really know? I was asleep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>